Good morning, Laura Wood. So glad to see everyone here this morning. A special welcome to anyone that is joining us online. We welcome you as well. Make sure to say hi in the chat. And let us know that you're here. Uh, but for all of us that are here on this beautiful spring uh, northwest day, it's just a wonderful day to praise the Lord. I don't know what it is, but something about the sun, uh, when the sun comes out and the weather is nice, it's like I get a little bit excited. Uh, I, I, you know, it's like, wow, we've been hiding in darkness for uh, five months and it's like the light, something about the light, right? That's actually biblical, by the way, uh, light, right? And we look forward to celebrating in just a few weeks, Easter Sunday, as we celebrate the resurrection and that Christ has come back to life, that he has uh, brought us back to life. As we do this morning and as we do every Sunday morning, we start our morning service with a call to worship. I invite us to stand up uh, and as we, as we look at this text from Philippians 2, uh, to just center our minds and our hearts, no matter where you are this morning, uh, this is our call to center us in on what the Word of God says. So I'll read the yellow text from Philippians 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that is our confession. That's our story, our song, right? Praising my Savior all the day long that every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. So let's sing together that truth and that reality, the blessed assurance that we have in Christ. Praising my Savior 
before you're seated, let me just call your attention to a couple things. We have these communication cards. Uh, they look just like that on the screen. We just ask at some point during the service, could you fill out that card? Let us know you're here. Let us know how we can pray for you. We take our offering at the end of the service. And so uh, place it in the offering basket. And if this is your first time at Laurelwood, if you fill out that card, uh, we're going to donate 10 meals to the Clark County Food Bank on your behalf. Just a way that we can uh, think of the greater works and the needs of our community here at Laurelwood. And then every Sunday we have uh, men and women who want to meet with you, pray with you, answer questions. And so for those who are in service, we invite you to our fireside gathering. And now let's take a moment to greet those around us and welcome them here to the house of the Lord today. Good morning, Laurelwood. I'm Allison DeVinney, the Women's Director, and here's what's happening at Laurelwood. Last Sunday, we introduced 25 new member candidates during the worship service. This is a reminder to all of our current members that you have until 2 p.m. today to vote. You should have received a link to the ballot in your email last week, or you can also access that through Friday's e-bulletin. Let's continue to praise God for the good things he's doing here at Laurelwood. Easter is coming soon. On March 31st, we'll have two services, one at 9 and one at 1030 with Child Carrot Bowl. Our theme this year is Back to Life. We'll be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and the new life we have in him. We look forward to celebrating with you on this special Sunday. As our church grows, we're looking at expanding our small group ministry. If you're interested in leading a small group or just hearing more about what that looks like, Make sure to join Kevin today in room 306 after the service, where you can hear from him and other small group leaders about what that might look like. Last week, we were excited to announce our new children's director, Katie Dole. Today, after the service, you can meet with her and Pastor Eric in room 303 to ask questions or just to get to know her a little bit better. We want to be praying for Katie as she transitions into this new role and for Coach John as he prepares to retire. And we thank God for his provision and perfect timing. And that's what's happening at Laurelwood. Let's continue to worship the Lord through a time of reflective prayer. Good morning, Laurelwood. I'm, I'm Phil Ball, one and a half of your elders. And uh, <laughs> sorry. On a serious note, today we are praying for the afflicted, and uh, as we pray for the afflicted, um, I want to read Psalm 102, verses 1 through 17. Hear my prayer, Lord. Let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer me quickly. For my days vanish like smoke, my bones burn like glowing embers. My heart is blighted and withered like grass. I forget to eat my food. In my distress, I groan aloud, and I am reduced to skin and bones. I am like a desert owl, like an owl among the ruins. I lie awake. I have become like a bird alone on a roof. All day long, my enemies taunt me. Those who rail against me use my name as a curse. For I eat ashes as my food and mingle my drink with tears. Because of your great wrath, for you have taken me up and thrown me aside. My days are like the evening shadow. I wither like grass. But you, Lord, sit enthroned forever. Your renown endures through all generations. You will arise and have compassion on Zion, for it is time to show favor to her. 
The appointed time has come, for her stones are dear to your servants. Her very dust moves them to pity. The nations will fear the name of the Lord. All the kings of the earth will revere your glory. For the Lord will rebuild Zion and appear in his glory. He will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift up, Lord, all those who uh, are going through affliction, Lord, of, of many kinds, whether that's physical, uh, mental, spiritual. Lord, we pray, Lord, that uh, in their time of distress, we pray that, that they would be pressed near to your heart, that they would be um, reminded that you were there with them and, and walking that journey alongside them and that they might turn and pray to you, that they would faithfully keep hope in, in you and in you alone. We pray, Lord, that even in, their, in, in, even in those times of affliction, Lord, that, that you would bring joy in the midst of that and, and that in those times, too, that joy would be evident to others. Lord, we pray for a quick resolve to whatever is uh, afflicting them, whether that's illness, cancer, uh, grief, loss of a loved one, or, or maybe uh, anxiety, depression, or, or even a, a, a spiritual weight on them. For, for maybe attacks from the enemy. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would just show yourself faithful as you are faithful and that you would heal and that you would pour strength and fortitude and, and hope and that through, through their lives and all of our lives that, they would, that people around us would see suffering and know that you are there and see healing and see power and ultimately restoration, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you promise restoration. You, you promise full healing. So we, we hope in that. We have faith in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Phil. Let's continue worshiping. And those who are able to stand, let's stand together as we sing of our holy God.
Thank you, God, that you are a God of the individual, not just the hearts of you, Lord, that you have come here seeking hearts, not just the hearts as a whole, Lord, but actually every single one of us. We are not here by accident, Lord. You have destined us to be here in this moment. Oh, how you love us, and oh, how you want to meet us today, Lord. We just thank you for that. I ask that you would be with Pastor Eric today as he speaks, um, and that you would just, this would just be a sweet, sweet smell and sound to you. Our reading this morning is John chapter 13, verses 5 through 10. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. You are clean, though not every one of you. My name is uh, Eric. I'm lead pastor and the other half of your elders. Phil has the one and a half. I have the smaller half. I'm uh, grateful to be here. Um, you know, before we get started, I just, uh, there's some thanks in order uh, to um, many of you women in the church uh, for uh, just the generosity that was poured out upon us and our family at the uh, baby shower yesterday. Uh, and I also got kind of the uh, subliminal message that I've gotten so much that I plan to begin my Etsy account selling baby clothes. So thank you. Uh, I have some golf clubs I've been saving up for. No, uh, but in all seriousness, thank you so much. Uh, let's give a round of applause to our worship team. Huh? Thank you for them. Uh, uh, you know, this is a generous church. Uh, I was, Pastor Kevin and I were at a pastor's conference yesterday and meeting with many pastors throughout the Northwest, and many of them don't have multiple teams who can bring them before God like you are and like you have. The gifts that we have in this church, let us praise God for them and make sure to encourage those among us who serve with their time and talents. Um, with that being said, uh, we are now in our final kind of message on this little series on what it looks like to walk by faith. Uh, we began looking at a famous passage, the rich young ruler, and we talked about how sometimes taking the next step is actually quitting something. Uh, Jesus challenged the rich young ruler to quit, to quit trusting uh, in his own view and his own level of success. Uh, secondly, then we then moved and looked, I, forget, I even forget what we looked at. You guys remember, I'll let you look at the bulletin. But secondly, we then looked at uh, yet another story of what it looks like to walk by faith. And in this story, what we're going to look at is we're going to finish up the series. And we're going to look at a well-known passage, John chapter 13. Uh, but before we jump into that, I want you to turn to your neighbor and ask them this question. When's the last time God allowed you to be uncomfortable? Go ahead and take your time. I'm going to turn to your neighbor and ask him this. When's the last time God allowed you to be uncomfortable? <laughs> Amen. 
Amen, amen. Praise God. Some of you, raise your hand if you, were, if you were able to identify a specific time and place. Okay, fantastic. Keep your hand up if God has you there right now. Raise your hand up now. Praise God. Fantastic. You know, there's a lot of paradoxes in the Bible. One is this whole idea that God is the God of all comfort, yet he seemingly allows us to get into such uncomfortable waters, isn't it? Uh, it seems strange. Uh, sometimes we are in uncomfortable situations because of our own self, our own sin, our own kind of predicaments. Other times, God seemingly just lets us in there uh, to reveal something. As long as I've been a Christian and as I've been pastoring, though, I've learned this one thing when it comes to being uncomfortable, is that when God wants us to grow, he will allow us to be uncomfortable. There are moments in our life like that, and in these uncomfortable situations, if we're to grow, God will put this situation in our life and teach us how to respond. And the way we respond in uncomfortable situations is really the difference. And that's the text I want to look at this morning. Will you go and take your Bibles and open it up to John chapter 13. No slides today, just kind of the voice. If you look at the back of your bulletins and you're in need of a Bible, you'll see it on the page number. And the text I want to kind of push at to you today, the, the idea is that walking by faith means trusting Jesus now, especially when you're uncomfortable. We come to John 13, a classic text, uh, None other than the Last Supper meal. Uh, at this moment, the disciples have been with Jesus for three years. Three years with him, ministering, learning at his feet. Finally, uh, the last six days of his life, he pulls away for a Bible conference and he brings his most dear to him and they have a meal. And in the midst of the meal, John records it. It's kind of chaotic. It like starts and then it stops. And uh, while many times this really, Jesus has a lot to teach the disciples in this meal, but there's something here for us about faith. And it's found predominantly in the situation, the back and forth that our Lord has with none other than the disciple who's always at the butt of the joke, the disciple Simon Peter. And so this morning, I want to look at this under three headings. I want to look at the uncomfortable example, the obstacles that we must get through, and the future that is found for those who will trust in Christ. Let's begin with the uncomfortable example. And this is really found in verse 5. It says that quite simply that in the midst of the meal, after that, Jesus got up and he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. No doubt, many of you who've been a Christian for many years know this text. And you're aware that in this context, for a king uh, to take off his garment, and the Jews, they often wore two garments. One was kind of a garment to just keep them cool in the heat so that the blistering heat didn't burn them. The other was the outer garment. And our Lord, in the midst of this, takes off one and, you know, he sits down and begins to wash their feet. Uh, doubtless, you know that this was a task that was menial, that was necessary, but not indicative of a king. Matter of fact, washing feet was so bad that even, even Jewish slaves were forbidden to do it. The women and children were the ones who were allowed to do this. But no, not, nothing less than a king in Israel would think of washing feet. But a necessary job. I suppose like the maids who churn over rooms in a hotel in between stays or the custodian who uh, has the joy of taking out the trash after the children's lunch. Uh, it's not a job that I would sign up for or a career day uh, profile, but something that's very necessary. And for these people, they were walking in the Middle East. And naturally, you know, with the dust and the dirt, their feet would and stuff would get in between their toes all don't want, I want to spare your lunch, so I won't get into the details. But you would have understood how dirty of a thing this would be. And can you picture the scene, the way John explains it? You have 12 disciples who have been following the king of the earth. And all of a sudden, in the midst of the meal, 
uh, he gets up and he begins to stoop down and wash their feet. Uh, cringeworthy uh, is what my study Bible says. I'm just kidding. But none other than a cringy, cringeworthy sight. Uh, as he goes about uh, teaching them such an uncomfortable example, these Jewish men who years grew up on this culture to where you didn't touch feet, much less a king. But as such, this example was a well-known lesson that the Lord was trying to teach them about God. And this is the truth. And the timeless truth we see in this uncomfortable example is that greatness in the eyes of God are reserved for those who serve instead of seeking to be served. Don't miss that. The Lord, in showing them, was teaching them something about greatness. And he said that greatness in the eyes of God are reserved for those who seek to serve instead of being served. One commentator put it like this, with such power and status at Jesus' disposal, we might have expected him to defeat the devil in an immediate uh, flash confrontation or to devastate Judas with just uh, like cyclops, lasers piercing through his heart. Uh, But instead he washed the disciples' feet along with the feet of the betrayer. And what this has to tell us is that, again, the greatness in God's eyes are reserved for those who seek to serve instead of being served. Jesus explained this again because if you follow the disciples, you know they often argue. They often argue about who's the best. Remind me of myself and my buddies in school. It's a sad situation. But Jesus had revealed this lesson to them before. You see, there was this one moment where uh, a helicopter mom, it seems like James and John had a helicopter mother. No, uh, I won't touch that, but let's just, yeah, there's a helicopter mom. And she goes to Jesus and uh, he says, listen, I, my boys are so good. I, I want one to sit on the right hand and one to be on the left hand. They went in covert. Uh, and the disciples caught wind of this and they were about to uh, start fighting. And Jesus said these words to them in Matthew 20. He said, not so with you. He said, instead, whoever wants to be him great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came to be served, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Brothers and sisters, this is a truth that has been characteristic of God's people throughout generations. This serving was the very truth and power that brought Rome to its knees as the people of God began to seek the benefit of others instead of themselves. The Apostle Paul is talking to probably his favorite church, uh, the Philippians, and he reminds them of this. And he says this, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus did, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing, By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Paul was explaining to them the uncomfortable truth that in the eyes of God, serving is what is great instead of seeking to be served. The famed preacher Martin Luther King Jr. said, not everybody can be famous in the world. But everyone can become great because greatness is determined by service. We come to this uncomfortable example, and as I search my heart, I suppose the challenge of this example is that in order to do this, I have to not be focused on me. That's very hard for me. I like to be focused on me. This is in line with what Jesus said when he talked about the greatest commandments to first love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. What a challenge to practice this in our current culture. Amen? Our culture sees this as weakness. If there's one thing I've learned about being with people is that every one of you want to make a mark in life. None of us wants, and that's a good thing, but none of us, nobody here wants to go through life without some sort of mark of greatness. And we're grateful that the Lord says it's ambition is not a bad thing. 
But as I look out into my culture, brothers and sisters, the model of greatness are often in contrast to what Jesus has done. They're often ideas of people dominating another, uh, of seeking to gain over a person. It seems that our current culture sees greatness in terms of getting for self instead of giving to God. But it's uncomfortable, this example, and inevitably what Jesus is calling them to do is to have faith. To put faith that Jesus' way of leadership, Jesus' way of greatness, which was so different than what they grew up with and what they had seen before them, was in fact the better way. It was to serve now and to let our rights and rewards be given in due time. Let me ask you this. What does it look like for you today to become great? In following this example of our Lord who got down to, in an uncomfortable way to show his sign of greatness, what does greatness look like for you this morning? Perhaps for some of you, it's, you're going to say when you get home and this time you're not going to veg out on TV or scroll on YouTube or go out to the shop to seek an escape, but be present with the family to give them the time they need to listen What's happening in that moment is that you're listening to the call to trust Jesus and you're doing that which is uncomfortable and unnatural. Pastor Kevin has a small group meeting after church. There are many of us here who I'm certain the Lord uh, has given much things to share, uh, to lead. Uh, But what's holding you up is perhaps it's a fear thing, but there are others to where God is calling you to be great. And in greatness, it's to serve. And what we see in just this quick thing is none other than the uncomfortable example that Jesus called the disciples to. And that was that greatness is defined in service, not seeking oneself. And yet as we see this, we've heard this many times, yet we struggle to do it because we have obstacles we have to go come over, don't we? We have hurdles we must uh, jump and need God's help. And what we see in verse 6 through 8 are three obstacles that Peter has to get over. All of them are obstacles that we must uh, get through if we're going to seek to walk by faith. We see really the first obstacle in verse 6. It says, He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? I don't know, perhaps he had smelled them before, who knows, but he had seen this and it shook him. What we see none other than this is the first obstacle for Peter was one of culture. I've explained this. I won't belabor it too much. But our Lord uh, was greatly loved by Peter. And Peter, being a Jewish person, uh, grew up again uh, with not this image. And, and then to see the king come down and serve must have just been jarring to where he said, Lord, are, are you going to wash my feet? You see, his culture obscured what Jesus was doing. You remember something about the disciples? You know how one of their things is they always believed uh, in the second coming instead of the first coming. What I meant by that is they often believed that Jesus would come on robes with a sword in hand to slay the Romans first. That was their great holdup. They had, because of culture, put this idea in their mind of what Jesus had come to do. And yet, that image must have put Isaiah 53, 4 through 6 in the back to where they had perhaps forgotten it. For as we look at what Isaiah 53 says, it tells us that Jesus in his first coming would not come with glory, but in humility. Isaiah 53 says it like this, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken and afflicted. Yet he was pierced for our transgressions. The punishment brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we were healed. Peter had a misunderstanding of his mission, for the Lord did not come first to conquer, but to serve as a sacrifice. And so in in being struck by this, Peter says, no, Uh, no, no, no. That's our first obstacle is one of culture. The second obstacle, control. 
look at what happens. Jesus replies and he says, listen, just let me do this now. Okay? You'll, I'll tell you what I've got going on later, but let me do it now. The NIV in verse 8 says, no. He said, no, you shall never wash my feet. Just, you hear how it's read, read like that? There's almost this offensiveness. Peter's offended, uh, angered. Uh, the idea is that he thought this was out of order. Brother and sister, to walk by faith is to trust in God's promises enough to live by them. To walk by sight is to let what you can understand dictate your reality. You want to know something I've discovered in my own life? When I'm walking by sight, I see problems. When I'm walking by faith, I see opportunities. Peter saw nothing but a problem here. Something that he didn't understand. And what we have to see here just in this exchange is yet another truth that God's ways are higher than our ways. Isaiah has said it like this, my ways are higher than your ways, saith the Lord. Job, as he was confounded with what happened to him, just broke out and said, can you discover the depths of God? Can you understand the limits of the Almighty? This isn't the first time someone's been shook up by Jesus. There was one man, the greatest preacher in all of Israel, a man called the teacher, Nicodemus. And when Jesus spoke to him, he said, hey, the Holy Spirit, he moves wherever you go, wants to go. He does what he wants. Brother and sister, God's ways are higher than ours. And so we see these really two uncomfortable obstacles. One is an issue of culture that causes Peter to un not misunderstand why Jesus came. The second is a, a problem of control. Uh, Peter is so used to things happening a certain way that when Jesus flips the script on him, He's offended. He's angered. He'd say, this is out of order. Now, brother and sister, I mean, you are smart, erudite people. You know what the application is here, don't you? It's a simple truth. The application is to trust Jesus now, even when it's uncomfortable. Message over. Just kidding. But here's the thing. Why don't we do it? Why do we listen to sermon after sermon and study book after book and follow year after year yet struggle to do this? Such a simple thing. I want to take a look at Peter. The problem Peter did is really the egregious sin was not letting God do his thing, was denying the words of God. Jesus said, let me do this. Peter said, no. This is none other than straight line disobedience. But what's kind of the sin underneath it? Why does he freak out like that? Why does he become so offended that God would seek to do this? As I look at this text, I see the challenge for Peter was none other than pride. You see, Peter had in mind what he wanted Jesus to do for him. And what ultimately Peter wanted Jesus to do is he wanted Jesus to go along with his plan, to go through and bring uh, victory to the Roman Empire. Peter also didn't want uncomfortability. The thought of having to serve and, and even to first wash feet was too much. Brother and sister, what Peter was seeking to do was none other to control Christ. He had Peter's idea of what and how this was going to be laid out. And that Jesus was to continue to follow that. And the moment that that broke was the moment that Peter said, I'm done. Let me ask you this. Is there anything that God could ask of you that you would say no to? Uh, is there anything that God would ask that you say, no, that's uncalled for, that you would ask me that? Because that's what Peter says in this moment. As I look in my heart, brothers and sisters, I find that when I'm seeking to control Christ, when I want what he can do for me, when I'm trying to manipulate these things and God goes a different way, 
is when I'm ready to just hang it up and I've known that I've left the gospel in that moment for I'm not worshiping him, but I'm worshiping the things that he can get me. For Peter and the disciples, they were all hung up that the Lord was gonna come and they would be the cat's meow. They'd be the ones down the field in the parade, not the ones serving. And so what we see is none other than a challenge that we have. Like Peter, we must be careful to not let the cultural vision dominate or, show, or give us what a picture of who we ought to think Christ is. But rather, what God wants us to do is what he wanted Peter to do, which was to be okay with what God said. That God's word would be enough. And he said it like this, you don't realize what I'm doing, but trust me, you'll, you'll understand later. In other words, he's wanting us to truly be humble, which is to come under God and trust his character. So for Peter, the obstacles he had to uncover was one of his culture. Second was one of control that resulted in an attitude of offensiveness to God. So too, brothers and sisters, we must be careful that we don't seek the blessings that God can give us so that when he wants to turn left, we would leave him in the dust. Having looked at now the obstacles we must uncover, I want to look at the future that is found for those who trust in Jesus now, even in the uncomfortability. He gives us three things here. The first in this back and forth is that we, we, Pete, God, Jesus tells Peter, listen, if you'll, if you'll put your trust in me, you'll go from being divided to united. Take a look at this like uh, in verse um, Eight, after Peter says, no, you shall never wash my feet, Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. That word part speaks of uh, two things, both an inheritance to claim because of a relationship that you have with somebody. We might say it a simpler way. It's the family and the family's benefits. And what we see Jesus saying to him is... Uh, Ultimately, this whole feet washing is pointing to my death. And if you won't trust me now, you'll be divided your whole time. Remember what the blessing of Christ coming is what John 1.12 said, that to those who received him, he gave them the right to become children of God. And here's something I want you to see about the Lord in all of this, and that is that throughout all of the Bible, God longs, to be with you. That's really what this is about. It's the inheritance for sure. But the, the, the real thing is that God wants to be with you. Did you know that uh, all this new covenant, all this coming of Christ, the real motivation for all of Jesus' coming was not just to forgive us from our sins, but the, the greatest motivation was to be with pe people. Ezekiel 37 says it like this in verse 27. He says, my dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Ultimately in Christ's coming, he wants us to be with him. God wants you to be with him. And so having that part not only results in us being with him, but it changes how God sees you. Brother and sister, when we put our faith in Christ... It changes how God sees us. Paul expounds on this greatly, but one of the, the great truths is we go from being divided and without a home to united as children of Christ. With all of his benefits, I could go on and on, but let me just take you to a passage that kind of showcases just some of the things we have when we trust in Christ. One is we have a sense of security. Romans 8.14 says it like this, that those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. I'm obviously not in ministry, but I've worked jobs where I'm just, in the words of Marshawn Lynch, here so I don't get fined. You know what I mean? I'm just trying to get paid. And uh, when the boss asks me to do something, I do it for fear of punishment. And some of you have had jobs like that. But brother and sister, this verse says that when we will uh, let and trust Christ now, we don't have to worry uh, that our job is in jeopardy. 
We don't relate to God as employees to where he kind of keeps uh, this uh, kind of back and forth with us, but rather we have a full part with him that cannot be taken away. It gives us security. Secondly, uh, it gives us a certain sense of intimacy. Uh, verse 15 says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves that you live in fear again, but rather the spirit you receive brought about your adoption. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The idea that upon trusting in Christ, God relates to us like a father, and we can come to him as an intimate child. Yet another blessing we have in being united to Christ is that we have a sense of assurance. It says it like this in verse 17. Now, or verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Brother and sister, that spirit you have in your heart that reminds you uh, and, and amens is yet a proof that you have part with Christ. And lastly, we inherit what he gives. Verse 17 says, now if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings. What Jesus was saying is, that was all the stuff I have for you, if you'll trust me now. Peter, if you leave, you'll miss out on all this. You'll be divided instead of united. That's the first thing we need to see is that as a result, when we place our trust in Christ, we go from being divided to united. But secondly, we go from being dirty to clean. Jesus says it like this. Verse 10, well, verse 9, Peter says, Not just my feet and my hands and my head as well. We give them We'll give them encouragement. I mean, who here has uh, had a hard time understanding what God said? Amen. I mean, uh, he's a literalist. So some of y'all love that. Uh, he lets the word speak. Uh, and so he says, I'll wash everything. And Jesus says to him in verse 10, here it is. Those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet, but their whole body is clean. Oh, what a, what, what a thing. What Jesus is saying is that perfection, cleanliness happens by pronouncement of God, not by the things we do. You know, I've noticed it could just be a temperament I have. I don't know if you're like this, but uh, this really helps me walk by faith because I can have a tendency to replay all the mistakes I've made. You know, uh, either things that have been done to me or things that I've done. You see, some of you have a great memory. I said, yeah, it's, it's got advantages, it's got disadvantages. You don't forget a thing. And as I go back and think about all the things I failed at or all the things that have been done to me, there's this sense in which I can feel dirty, uh, like I'm not all right. And what Jesus reminds me and reminds Peter is that you're completely clean, not because of what you've done, because of who you've been looking for and looking at. You've been trusting in me. You go from being dirty to clean. You go from being divided to united. The changes. And then thirdly, as they're in this discussion, Jesus says one more thing. He says, not only do you go being from being divided to united with Christ, not only do you go from being dirty to clean, but you go from being dead to a growing Christian. Take a look back at verse 10. There's this other line Jesus says, and he says, uh, he's got this kind of interesting line about feet yet again. He says, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. What's that? What does that mean? The idea being that, you know, in Israel, you bathe and then you go outside and then you kind of get feet dirty. Uh, you don't need to go back inside and rewash your feet. Uh, you know, if I go to Seaside, Pastor Kevin and I were at Seaside at the pastor's conference, walking the beach. Not him and I, though I love him as a brother, but <laughs> not him and I. Um, don't worry, Francesca. Um, so, uh, but we were just walking, you know, and as we walk the beach, what, the feet get dirty. As I go into the room, I just wipe off my feet, but I'm still clean. What John is pointing to in this sense is he's talking about as a result of trusting in Christ, Christ begins this work where he, over time, cleanses us. A word you might have heard is called sanctification. Have you heard that word? 
It's the idea that as we continue to trust in him, over time, Jesus forms us even more to be like him in every way. 1 John 3, 1 through 3 says it uh, like this. It says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we shall be called children of God, and that is what we are. He says, the reason the world doesn't know us is it didn't know him. But he says, we're the children of God, and what we have been has been made known, and all who have this hope purify themselves just as he is pure. In other words, as we place our hope in Jesus, what happens is we commit to growing. The Holy Spirit works in us to make us more like Christ. There is a future hope that we get to have. And what Jesus is telling Peter is, if you won't trust me, you'll miss out on all of it. Peter, you have to let the culture go aside. You got to let the control fall away. And you have to trust, not what you can see, but I'll tell you later. But if you don't, you'll stay divided. You'll stay dirty. You'll stay dead instead of being united, clean, and growing. Now, we see this wonderful thing, but we have to ask the question, how exactly did Jesus do this? Because the truth is, I just mentioned how easy it is for our heart to uh, be a, do like Peter did. Uh, get an idea of what we want Jesus to do and con- get him and try to control him. Brother and sister, go with me to Matthew 26 if you can. If not, that's okay. I'll read it. What we come to is ultimately you and I, we can't trust him when it's uncomfortable. Uh, We have had many a time where God calls us to put him in faith now, but we still struggle. Peter, when before him in an uncomfortable situation, wasn't able to trust God. But the way that the reason that we can stand here as Christian people united to Christ, clean and growing, is ultimately because Jesus, brother and sister, was willing to trust his father now in the midst of an uncomfortable situation. Matthew twenty six thirty six in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says Jesus went with his disciples to a place and he told them, Will you sit here so we can go pray? Uh, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and they, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said, my soul's overwhelmed. I'm stressed out. Stay here. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground. And he said, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. What a human prayer that the Lord himself was so stressed that he said, could we do it a different way? Do I have to? This is going to be very uncomfortable. For the first time in my life, I'm not going to know you. I'm going to experience sin. I'm going to experience pain. Can I do it differently? We're not told what is said back and forth. But what we find is Jesus' words to his dad in verse 42. He says, my father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. In the words of my mentor, he says, I can't, Lord, you can. Will you please help me? What was the uncomfortable thing that God had for him? Betrayal by a friend. Judas, the man whose feet he washed, just churned out there and sold him. Yet number two, he was hated by the very ones he had come to save. Tortured at the hands of men. And ultimately, the uncomfortability of death on a cross. That was all the things that he had to do. And what God asked him to do was to trust him now in the midst of an uncomfortable situation. Paul the Apostle must have reflected on this along with other things. And as he's talking to the church, he he reflects on this and says, well, because Jesus did this, all of the promises that I've spoken about are yes and amen. 2 Corinthians 1, 20 through 22 says it like this. No matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now, if it is God who makes both us and you stand firm. Now, it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit 
guaranteeing what is to come. In other words, we stand now in the place we stand because Jesus was willing to say yes to his father now in the midst of an uncomfortable situation so that we can say yes to Jesus now in our life. And so that, you know what, when we say no to him, we're still children. All because of that day, he was willing to say, I trust you now, even though I'm uncomfortable. This text has brought us to the reality that walking by faith means trusting him now, even in the midst of uncomfortability. The thing we need is none other than the thing that God has for us, and that is love. Love for him. Love for us. As we get ready to close now, I have some applications for us. Number one, as we look at this text, a simple application is, will you say yes now? You know, most of the Christian life is trusting him now, understanding him later. And you really have to know your heart on this. Uh, there are those who you have a suspicious heart, you know. It's, uh, things come up and it's always seen in the negative. Uh, and I could be like that and uh, that could do a, wreak havoc on us trusting God because we assume something bad that he has for us. Say yes to him now. And when you don't have the details, guess what? He'll fill them in. I've always thought, do you think Abraham would have trusted God if he knew all the things that God showed him all in a flash what was going to happen? Let me ask you, would you say yes to God even if you knew every single detail? Some of you are better than me. I probably would have said no. It's too much. But trust him now. Number two, confront with the Holy Spirit the lies that are stopping your forward progress. You know, Peter had a lie, ultimately, that stopped him, a lie of his culture, a lie of his own view on what God was supposed to do, even though he had three years with him. Let me ask you, what's hard for you to let Jesus do but is probably good for you? You ask that question of God, he'll show it. Confront the lie with the spirit that is stopping the progress for you to trust Jesus now. Number three, wash yourself daily in the promises of God. You're already clean. Uh, you're sure the Lord's gonna wash your feet. He'll sanctify you. He, he, he'll do it. But each day you need to remind yourself of the fact that you're clean, that you're united with Christ, that because he did his part, we are in part with him. One author said it like this, what Jesus is bringing about in the sometimes confusing, very painful work he does in our lives is washing our feet. He not only bathes us, completely removing the guilt of sin, but in love, he keeps forgiving us. So what's important today? Not that we understand his purposes, yet that we trust in his character. I want to invite Pastor Kevin and the worship team up this morning. And my question to you is really, Will you do it? Now, what you need to know is God's already made you his child. You're already united with him. But will you heed verse 7? Will you let God do what he does now, understanding it hereafter? Will you, with the Spirit, confront the lies that are stopping forward progress? Will you bathe in the promises of God? And will you step forward and to the great thing that God had for you. Brother and sister, I want to leave you some time to go before the Holy Spirit to reflect and to wrestle with him. And then I'll close this in prayer. Take your time.
Heavenly Father, we're just uh, thankful for the truth that your son said yes to you now in his time so that we could have the promises that he's won for us. Father, we know right now, Lord, that we are clean before you. Uh, Lord, that we have a part with you as your children, little brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he was willing to say yes now. Father, I want to just pray for all of us. Lord, there are those of us here who uh, need to say yes now in the midst of their fear. Lord, we just acknowledge the fear. It's scary, Lord, to follow you. Um, it's scary not because it's not good, but because we don't always understand what you're doing. Help us say yes now. There are those who need to work with the Spirit to confront the lies that are stopping them from saying yes, like Peter. Identify those. Work with them, Holy Spirit, to reveal them the truth of who they are. And Lord, there are finally, Father, those, Lord, among us who need to wash ourselves in the promises of God. Would we do that? And Father, now as a sign of faith, as a way to say yes, we pray for the offering. Uh, Lord, knowing and asking, uh, Lord, and giving now to the one who gave all of us. Whether we give online or in person, we ask, Lord, that this would be a faith thing. One of those things where we say we don't understand now, but we'll hear after. And so, Lord, we pray and ask that you would use all these gifts that others would find who they can trust. That the church would be equipped to trust and that we would be sent out to show you. Father, we ask this now in Jesus' name and your whole church said, amen. Uh, if you're we're thankful, uh, communication card, you, that's your offering this morning.
We're going to close by celebrating and singing of our great God. Let's sing this together. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds that I have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe to stay. please. As you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And as you go out, and as you come in, and as you lie down, and as you wake up, would you remember that you belong to the Lord. Have a blessed day, brothers and sisters. Uh, for those uh, who are interested in the um, kind of Katie meet and greet, we'll do that in about 11.45, so in about 10 minutes or so. That'll be in, right over here in room 303.